Aaron and I are standing here on the floor now with former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, who was here ringing the bell, commemorating uh, 30 years of U.S.-China relations, which, of course, were made possible by the uh, hard work that uh, Secretary Kissinger did while serving under President Nixon. And uh, we welcome you, sir. Thank you very much for being Great with us. Be here. Uh, the obvious first question is the situation in Gaza. What is that's an area of the world you have worked uh, very hard on? What is your view? How serious is this? Uh, uh, we have to remember Israel withdrew from Gaza unconditionally in 2005, and they are reacting to rocket attacks that have been launched out of Gaza. So. The problem is, can those rocket attacks be stopped? And then they will have to stop their military operations. It's a complicated situation, but it's one that I believe uh, will be solved because uh, if peace is to evolve in the Middle East, Israel has to take its responsibilities, but the moderate Arab nations have to take responsibilities for the conduct of Israel's neighbors. Do you believe that this is, uh, some people say that rocket, everything will stop a few days before the Obama uh, inauguration, that this is all very politically motivated. Uh, do, you, do you think that's true? I think it's a continuing process. The fundamental problem is can uh, Gaza conduct itself in a way that it is not a military threat to Israel? Then. There will have to be a negotiation eventually, and soon, between Israel and the Palestinians uh, about an overall peace settlement. What do you think the most important thing is for Barack Obama? Obviously, you're here to talk about uh, the anniversary for U.S.-China diplomatic relations, but if you had to say this is going to be the country or the conflict or the place that will define the Obama administration, what would it be? Well, the president-elect is coming into office at the moment when there are upheavals in many parts of the world simultaneously. You have India, Pakistan, and you, you have uh, uh, the uh, jihadist movement. So he can't really say that it's one problem, that it's the most important one. Uh, but he can give a new impetus to American foreign policy, partly because the reception of him is so extraordinary around the world. I think his task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. It isn't just a crisis. Are you confident about the people uh, President-elect Obama has chosen to surround him because he does not have a great deal of experience? No, he's, uh, he has appointed an extraordinarily able group of people in both the international and financial field. Mr. Secretary, we thank you very much for your time. Dr. Kissinger, thank Appreciate you very it. much. Nice. Former Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. As I've said before, Europe is America's closest partner. Uh, Europe, including the European Union, is the cornerstone of our engagement around the globe. Uh, we are more secure and we are more prosperous. The world is safer and more just when Europe and America stand as one. It is in response to this tragic history that in the aftermath of World War II, America joined with Europe to reject the darker forces of the past and build a new architecture of peace. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceeding, and it had great iron teeth, devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. We strongly condemn Russia's repeated violations of international law. Russia must stop its aggressive actions against Ukraine, withdraw its thousands of troops from Ukraine and the border regions, 
and stop supporting the separatists in Ukraine. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of man, and a mouth, speaking great things. President of the United States of America. It's a great honor to be the first sitting U.S. president to visit Wales. We've met at a time of transition and a time of testing. After more than a decade, NATO's combat mission in Afghanistan is coming to an end. Russia's aggression against Ukraine threatens our vision of a Europe that is whole, free, and at peace. In the Middle East, the terrorist threat from ISIL poses a growing danger. Here at this summit, our alliance has summoned the will, the resources, and the capabilities to meet all of these challenges. First and foremost, we have reaffirmed the central mission of the alliance. Article 5 enshrines our solemn duty to each other. An armed attack against one shall be considered an attack against them all. This is a binding treaty obligation. It is non-negotiable. And here in Wales, we've left absolutely no doubt. We will defend every ally. Second, we agreed to be resolute in reassuring our allies in Eastern Europe. Increased NATO air patrols over the Baltics will continue. Rotations of additional forces throughout Eastern Europe for training and exercises will continue. Naval patrols in the Black Sea will continue and all 28 NATO nations agreed to contribute to all of these measures for as long as necessary. Third, to ensure that NATO remains prepared for any contingency, we agreed to a new readiness action plan. The Alliance will update its defense planning. We will create a new highly ready rapid response force that can be deployed on a very short notice. We'll increase NATO's presence in Central and Eastern Europe with additional equipment, training, exercises, and troop rotations. And the $1 billion initiative that I announced in Warsaw will be a strong and ongoing U.S. contribution to this plan. Fourth, all 28 NATO nations have pledged to increase their investments in defense and to move toward investing 2 percent of their GDP in our collective security. These resources will help NATO invest in critical capabilities, including intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and missile defense. And this commitment makes clear that NATO will not be complacent. Our alliance will reverse the decline in defense spending and rise to meet the challenges that we face in the 21st century. Fifth, our alliance is fully united in support of Ukraine's sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity, and its right to defend itself. To back up this commitment, all 28 NATO allies will now provide security assistance to Ukraine. This includes non-lethal support to the Ukrainian military, like body armor, fuel, and medical care for wounded Ukrainian troops, as well as assistance to help modernize Ukrainian forces, including logistics and command and control. Here in Wales, we also sent a strong message to Russia that actions have consequences. Today, the United States and Europe are finalizing measures to deepen and broaden our sanctions across Russia's financial, energy, and defense sectors. At the same time, we strongly support President Poroshenko's efforts to pursue a peaceful resolution to the conflict in his country. The ceasefire announced today can advance that goal, but only if there is follow-through on the ground. Pro-Russian separatists must keep their commitments, and Russia must stop its violations of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Beyond Europe, we pay tribute to all those from our ISAF mission, including more than 2,200 Americans who have given their lives for our security in Afghanistan. NATO's combat mission ends in three months. 
and we are prepared to transition to a new mission focused on training, advising, and assisting Afghan security forces. Both presidential candidates have pledged to sign the bilateral, uh, bilateral security agreement that would be the foundation of our continued cooperation. But, uh, as we all know, the outcome of the recent election must be resolved. And so we continue to urge the two presidential candidates to make the compromises that are necessary so Afghans can move forward together uh, and form a sovereign, united, and democratic nation. Finally, we reaffirm that the door to NATO membership remains open to nations that can meet our high standards. We agreed to expand the partnership that makes NATO the hub of global security. We're launching a new effort with our closest partners, including many that have served with us in Afghanistan, to make sure our forces continue to operate together. And we'll create a new initiative to help countries build their defense capabilities, starting with Georgia, Moldova, Jordan, and Libya. I also leave here confident that NATO allies and partners are prepared to join in a broad international effort to combat the threat posed by ISIL. Already, uh, already allies have joined us in Iraq, uh, where we have stopped ISIL's advances. We've equipped our Iraqi partners and helped them go on offense. NATO has agreed to play a role in providing security and humanitarian assistance to those who are on the front lines. Key NATO allies stand ready to confront this terrorist threat through military, intelligence, and law enforcement, as well as diplomatic efforts. And Secretary Kerry will now travel to the region to continue building the broad-based coalition that will enable us to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. So taken together, I think the progress we've achieved in Wales makes it clear that our alliance will continue to do whatever is necessary to ensure our collective defense and to protect our citizens. The Americans have been bombing IS in Iraq at the request of the Iraqi government. They are unlikely to get a UN resolution to extend the strikes to the IS power base in Syria. The bombers won't get an invitation from the Syrian government either, without the kind of deal with the regime which Washington and London say would be unacceptable. There's another legal argument for bombing about protecting civilians, but it's very controversial. Whatever happens, if the NATO allies want to fight IS, they'll need to build a coalition. Saudi Arabia and Iran both see IS as a threat. But they back opposing sides in the Syrian war. The Saudis support Sunni Muslim rebels, some of which now support the group which calls itself Islamic State. Iran supports Assad. And it talks of cooperation against IS. Many IS fighters traveled through Turkey to get to Syria and Iraq. From Turkey, you can see IS flags flying in a town they control just over the Syrian border. Turkey's President Erdogan celebrated a national holiday at the weekend before he left for the NATO summit. His allies might be pressing him to tighten up the Turkish border. The conflict with IS is tearing apart the already ragged state of Iraq. In northern Iraq, Kurdish Peshmerga fighters are seen as a vital force against IS. So far, they've had more promises of weapons from abroad than deliveries. The Kurds say they need much more, much faster. This is not the first border we will break. Inshallah, we will break other borders also. But we IS propaganda boasts of how they've abolished the border between Iraq and Syria. They want to remake the Middle East. The turbulence in the region means a response is very difficult. The U.S. and its NATO allies announced a new coalition today. It's aimed at defeating and destroying those ISIS militants in Iraq and Syria. Word of this new effort came on the last day of the NATO summit being held in Wales. Our senior White House correspondent Chris Jansing there again for us tonight. Chris, good evening. Good evening, Brian. World leaders came here facing a whole series of daunting problems, including that new priority, the unexpected rise of ISIS. So meetings were added, adjusted, and in the end, the unanimous opinion was that ISIS poses such a significant and growing threat that degrading its ability to do harm just isn't enough. The day began with an awe-inspiring display of air power. 
and ended with some potentially significant deal making. I would argue there's a lot that's been achieved specific here. Over two days of intense conversations inside the walls of Cardiff Castle and aboard the Royal Navy's fearsome new destroyer, a 10 country coalition was formed to destroy ISIS. You can't contain an organization that is running roughshod through that much territory, uh, causing that much havoc, displacing that many people, uh, killing that many innocents. A final plan could come within weeks, but allies are expected to focus on areas of expertise, Britain with its special forces, Jordan's intelligence operations, and Turkey helping with border control. The major challenge, though, is still to come getting Arab nations to provide the boots on the ground that the West won't. We can support them from the air, but ultimately we're going to need a, a strong ground game. With more American bombs dropping in Iraq today, there's also a political advantage. The president can more convincingly say he isn't going it alone. Also announced today, an agreement for a conditional ceasefire between Russia and Ukraine. I really hope that now peace process will be launched. And if it doesn't hold, Russia will get slapped with a new round of sanctions, while NATO forms a rapid response force to answer any future Russian aggression. And after two days of dealing with the modern world's most vexing problems, the president made an unscheduled stop at an ancient wonder. How cool is this? It is spectacular. Stonehenge, before heading home. Secretary of State John Kerry and Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel are not on Air Force One. They're heading to the Middle East to work out details of building this coalition, and they hope to have a plan ready for the next meeting of world leaders at the UN General Assembly later this month. Brian. Chris Jansen covering the president in the UK tonight. Chris, thanks. Let's talk more about this. Our political director and the new moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd, in our DC bureau. And Chuck, have we just witnessed the president change his tune, change the response this week to ISIS and the threat it poses? I sure think so, Brian. I mean, you and I talked about this earlier today when he made those comments. Uh, basically, he's using almost the same language that he and President Bush both used to use when targeting al-Qaeda, which, of course, are the folks responsible for 9-11, and that is they want to destroy and degrade ISIS. No ambiguity anymore. And as you know, Brian, for about a week, he did leave some ambiguity. Last week, it was the whole idea. He didn't have a strategy yet. Even earlier this week during this trip, when he talked about degrading and destroying ISIS to make them a manageable problem, this time today, he left out that. It does seem as if you now see the machinery in effect where you have this president, very reluctantly, but you have this president preparing the country to get back on war footing, even as he spent five years trying to get the country off of war footing. Yes, good, lovely. And the How cool is this? It is spectacular. Is this a place you always wanted to see, sir? It is. Knocked it off the bucket list right now. How are you? What's your name? I'm James. James? How cool is this though, really? Amazing. Yeah. Pretty cool. It's spectacular, isn't it? Amazing. It's interesting when I was flying over, it didn't seem that big, and so you kind of thought, oh, but when you actually are there, yeah. 
and it's a special place. President Obama did more than give that speech in Cairo today, along with some of his top staffers. He took in the sites of ancient Egypt, including the pyramids. The president visited the tomb of an Egyptian priest where a stone carving suddenly caught his eye because something looked familiar. And actually, that looks like me. Look at those ears. <laughs> President's tour guide went on to beg to differ. He said he's always thought the president looked more like King Tut of ancient Egypt. How cool is this? It is spectacular. Is this a place you always wanted to see, sir? It is. Knocked it off the bucket list right now. When the president goes sightseeing, the sight you see is him pointing, 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 pointing at the pyramid. This is bigger, isn't it? Pointing in a mosque where the press had to don those embarrassing booties, a fate the president and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton avoided by going shoeless as a tour guide demonstrated the acoustics. My voice carried. The president's voice carried at Cairo University where he kept quoting the Quran for his Muslim audience. The Holy Quran tells us, the Holy Quran teaches that, the Holy Quran tells us, oh mankind. The audience was kind to President Obama. Thank you. Though he is no doubt jet lagged, press secretary looked as if he was fighting off sleep during the speech. President Obama spoke so much about his Muslim experiences that the website Wonkette jokingly called this his Ich bin ein Muslim speech. The president even rattled off a few phrases in Arabic. Shukra. Saka. Assalamu alaikum. E pluribus unum. Wait a minute. That last one wasn't Arabic. That was Latin. It's what's inscribed on a quarter. Out of many, one. Many wanted to be the one to get the best spot at the photo op with Presidents Obama and Mubarak. Of course, the visual highlight was... Obviously. No, not him. It was the president touring the pyramids outside and in. Purification, mummification, self identification. That looks like me. Look at those ears. <laughs> Separated at birth from a hieroglyphic, but the president's guide saw another resemblance. Mr. President, you look like King Tut. I've been told. Yes, it's true. He should know about King Tut. Dr. Sahi Hawass oversaw scans of Tut's mummy that produced this likeness. Though President Obama tends to skip the eye makeup. The president's trip inspired Egyptians to display decorations calling Obama the new King Tut of the world. But even the new King Tut couldn't budge a pyramid. Still, it's good practice for trying to push peace in the Mideast. Ginny Mo, CNN, New York. President Obama says a strategy on dealing with ISIS terrorists in Syria is developing. And he repeated several times his ultimate objective of defeating the terrorist army that has now overtaken much of Syria and Iraq. But the pronouncement has left some lawmakers unconvinced of both the president's commitment and his ability to rally international support. 
Chief White House correspondent Ed Henry is traveling with the president and reports tonight from the NATO summit in Wales. While it took three news conferences in eight days to get there, President Obama finally got his message straight on battling ISIS. To degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. We are going to degrade and ultimately defeat ISIL. You systematically uh, degrade their capabilities. As the president hit those talking points again and again, there were no more admissions that he does not have a strategy, and not a word about how the terrorists could become a manageable problem. You can't contain an organization that is running roughshod through that much territory, uh, causing that much havoc, displacing that many people, uh, killing that many innocents, enslaving that many women. Uh, the goal has to be uh, to dismantle them. So he finally settled on dismantle and destroy as the goal. Though the big question will be whether the president and his team can follow through on a strategy to achieve it. With top Republicans charging, the president's failure to target ISIS's terrorist training camps over the Iraqi border into Syria has already given ISIS an edge. The fact that we have let this go, and especially over the last seven, eight months, as we've watched these columns of ISIS fighters travel city by city and have not hit them by the air. This is irresponsible. There also continues to appear to be daylight between the president and General Martin Dempsey, chairman of the Joint Chiefs. While the president claimed he did not have a military strategy yet to deal with ISIS in Syria because he was waiting on the Pentagon, Dempsey suggested otherwise in a Facebook town hall yesterday, saying, quote, at the president's direction, we have developed a military strategy with a series of options on how we can initially contain, continue to disrupt, and ultimately defeat ISIS. The day before in Estonia, the president implied again that the military was still tweaking the plan, stressing it was all about getting the details right. It is very important from my perspective that when we send our pilots in to do a job, that we know that this is a mission that's going to work, that we're very clear on what our objectives are, what our targets are. The differing statements among senior officials continue today, with Secretary of State John Kerry saying ISIS can be defeated, but it may take years. Kerry declaring, quote, it may take a year, it may take two years, it may take three years, but we're determined it has to happen. While the president has also said it will take a long time, earlier this week, a top Pentagon official suggested otherwise. I don't think that, that they're, that they're, you know, that this is a, a threat that's going to be in terms of, you know, years and years and years, but it's certainly one that we have to worry about right now. To show he's getting serious about taking on ISIS, the president said again today he's sending Kerry to the Mideast to help build a coalition with Arab nations. Though first, the commander-in-chief was thinking about his bucket list, making a pit stop at prehistoric Stonehenge before hustling back to Washington. Now about that coalition, a U.S. official tells us they now have nine other nations providing support in Iraq, but still no coalition for Syria. Secretary Kerry saying today uh, that when it comes to the support in Iraq, there will be no U.S. combat troops on the ground in Iraq, calling it a, quote, red line, although, of course, other red lines have been flexible. Brett? Ed Henry live in Wales at the NATO summit. Ed, thank you. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Can they be defeated without addressing that part of their organization which resides in Syria? The answer is no. We, that will have to be addressed on both sides of what is essentially at this point a non-existent border. Okay, very clearly there, that was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Martin Dempsey, on Thursday, speaking on the growing threat of ISIS. On the same day, Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel said the group was beyond anything we've seen. Very clear, ISIS bad. Now. A complete 180. General Dempsey saying yesterday the United States faces no direct threat from ISIS and he wouldn't recommend strikes in Syria yet. What the heck happened? Fox News military analyst Lieutenant General Thomas McInerney joins us from our nation's capital. General, uh, good morning to you. Good morning, Steve. Uh, yesterday, uh, Dempsey said, nah, you know what? Um, ISIS is just a regional threat. Somebody on Thursday picked up the phone and talked to the general, didn't they? 
Absolutely. Look, I'm standing by my comments Saturday to Uma Pumaraju on America's headquarters. Unchecked, ISIS is an existential threat to the United States, our allies, and very soon. General Dempsey was called by the White House, and they told both he and uh, Secretary Hagel, both of them who I commend greatly for what they said last Thursday, when they cried out for, we've got to get on with it. And there's this narrative in the White House that Osama bin Laden is dead, GM is alive, mm -hmm. everything is okay, just like they did, Steve, two years ago on uh, Benghazi when they knew an attack was coming and they ignored it That's right. just and, for the election. And that was on September the 11th, just before the election. All right. You say this September 11th, September 11th, 2014, we'll have another strike. I believe that we should go to DEFCON 1 and be prepared for another strike. There are too many indications. Senator Jim Inhofe, Senator uh, who you just was on several days ago, said that he believed an American city was going to be attacked. I believe American cities will be attacked and that we should be prepared for it. And if we keep on this same modus operandi, these patterns of behavior that this White House always pretends leading mm -hmm. up to an election that everything is okay, the American people are in danger. Sure. We need a massive air campaign in Iraq and Syria. And you say that one of the reasons the United States is in danger is because, while well, Dempsey may say it's a regional threat, ISIS is over there, because our southern border is wide open, we don't know who's coming in. Look, when we had this immigration crisis, which is still going on with uh, women and children coming across, the uh, border control people were saturated. The ISIS people have already come in. They are in our cities today. They are ready to attack us. 9-11 um, is a very attractive date for them, and I believe that we should be prepared, and we are not. Our commander-in-chief is not on the commander-in-chief role. He's out to lunch. All right, uh, General McInerney joining us with sobering words on this Monday morning. Well, the president's back to work today. Let's see if they do anything. General, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve.